Good afternoon, it's Joyful Hermit. Well, I should be painting. All I got was a double doors done. Takes a bit of effort getting things all ready, but maybe I'll do a little more, but my mid back started to really hurt. So I figured I'd better change, change occupations. And I had done a video earlier and it didn't record. I was laying in bed doing it and you know what I decided, and I'm pretty sure this is it, that uh, God didn't want me talking about that. I had gone into the past some because yesterday I had spent several hours working on a resume for my Canon Law 603 approval process. I hadn't done from 1987 to present. I had done all the prior including all my career stuff, but it, I hadn't done all of my Catholic years or a few years prior to that, different things that I did or was help, tried to help do, that kind of stuff. And, um, oh, I forgot to put courses in that I took too on Isaiah, Joshua, Jeremiah. So, um, took those at a university, a Bible. I mean, obviously it was in the Bible section of it. So undergrad, but it was very interesting. I always had to lay on the ground when I would go do things. People didn't mind too much. I mean, once they knew, understood, but, but, oh, I took Greek, but I dropped that. I was, I had started to have pain sieges and Oh, if you get behind in Greek, you can forget it. So, <laughs> so I forgot it. Um, anyway, I decided that, you know, God did, because when I got into the past, oh my, it was very traumatic, very traumatic things that happened. What could go wrong with me always did. And especially when I, I started out doing line items for the resume, I'll try to get my back rested here. Um, to get line items, but then when I would get into things that were painful, like all that with the soup kitchen and all the ugliness, the devil got involved and, and the horrible things in my own hometown. Then the Protestants were defending me because they knew me all my life. And, and the Catholics, of course, believed what the priest had said from the pulpit and which were not true and were really defamation but he somehow thought he thought I had all this power I guess and it was it was God was so blessing that outreach we were just growing by leaps and bounds and one time he says well this might turn into some kind of a social service out out outreach I said well what's wrong with that <laughs> God was blessing us with miracles and different things we even had a, a little school bus that we found right after I had said to this guy named Rick, we were driving to take a sofa to uh, a family that didn't have a sofa because people started donating furniture and clothing and things. And so a man who owned warehouses donated a warehouse for us to store stuff in. Then we had retired men and, and men like fire department or police that had, you know, oftentimes a couple of days off or different shifts. And they volunteered to use their pickup trucks to deliver for us. So um, it just worked out so smoothly and so easily. It was no problem. But it was interesting that he, uh, he was bothered by that. And it just didn't fit his personality. And, but he, he thought that I had some kind of power. And I didn't. I had established it all so that... When I had pain issues, other people, it just went on. I could have died, and I did essentially die to it. Spiritual da didn't like all that, what, uh, what he did to the mass, that priest. When, when the spiritual da found out that he had done four sermons on weekend masses with me as the topic and terrible things said from the pulpit, not the gospel, not anything but hate and evil. And... Um, and, but people believe it. You, you're going to trust a police like you trust a policeman or you trust trust the EMS or something. And um, you're supposed to trust your school principal or teacher. And 
we find out that people are sinners. You, you just can't trust. They had trusted a school principal who did, they hadn't even gotten his, his credential from him. So as part of uh, this process, they didn't really have one, so invited me to create a process for myself. And it's tough. I, I submitted my, my uh, proof of disability from 1987 and uh, mortgage information, my insurances for house and truck. And a truck is paid for finally, and it was a used one, but still, life costs. And then uh, proof of uh, medical insurances. I, um, I'm thinking of anything that if anyone wanted to slide by and later then be a problem. My psyche eval, they have Dr. H's contact information and permission to inquire because I, I already sent him money paid him for the psyche vow he did and you know explained the years that have known him and how we first met he started working with my children on divorce issues and some bad things that had happened to one of the daughters and so um helped me with pain management and any ideas for career after i lost lost it all from pain so um Yes, I think these things are important, especially for a hermit. They're alone. And the diocese is their director, guide, supposed to be guided by the diocese, supervised in other words. And so I had spoken more on that and I got off then in the video, just going back a little into these painful situations. A grant that I wrote and I got into that then on the video and how this principal plagiarized it totally. He didn't he didn't utilize the grant that I wrote for the Catholic schools that was hooked in with the soup kitchen. That's how they got the grant. The children were going to be using computers to do all of our saint notes and my, the newsletter I wrote, they were gonna type, print that up and you know, do any kind of graphics they wanted with it. They could learn to be creative. And enough money, it was $222,000 grant back in 1999, 98, 98 it was. Yes, 98. And uh, people who knew me were on the Eli Lilly Foundation, the Heritage Fund Foundation for the community grants and trusted me. But after a year they hadn't, that principal had used the money for other things. Those children never got their computer lab, nothing. And then he turned around and went to our Sunday visitor and applied for the grant all over again, but put his name on the grant that I wrote, plagiarized it. And uh, the spiritual does says, you, you're going to have to report this. You're going to have to notify our Sunday visitor and the bishop. And he says, but I can tell you already, it's going to turn on you just be prepared it's going to be awful for you and sure enough it was and I'd written a grant also for an icon printer for all the stuff we were printing for the to send out with the meals and and uh, letting people know you know what we had if they needed beds or sofas or any kinds of stuff like that we were just getting all these donations and then we had a miracle finding this little school bus after I just said, you know, we need a bus. We were driving along, delivering a sofa. This man named Rick and I were. He was a wonderful volunteer. And um, at the time was with our Sunday visitor even. But um, I said, we need a bus. And we turned to Bend, heading to these people. They lived out in the country more. And I said, there's our bus. There's, our, there's the cutest little school bus sitting in a parking lot. And we got closer and said, there's a sign on it. It's for sale. It's our bus. God has provided. That was the, that was the motto. I always said, God will provide. God will provide. And I use it to this day. And God has always provided. But um, anyway, everything just went after I was pretty much scapegoated out. But it was the spiritual da who said, after those homilies against me by the priest, he says, you're not 
ever going back, ever. It's time for the children to grow up. Well, I did all I could to help all the volunteers and they just kept it going, it's still going, but it changed drastically. And um, it's dwindling and they, and there were lots of good things that had brought both parishes together, the warring parishes, us humans, the Germans and the Irish came to that town back in the 1800s, mid, later 1800s, and, and they, to this day, have this separation since. But with the food prep on Saturday, the people would come after Mass from both parishes, and they started to get to know each other. It was just beautiful how God brought fruit from all that. But they haven't done that. They they don't do the preps like like we had to start with. When I was gone, then they made it easier, and th they just didn't understand the purpose, all the good it was doing to do the extra. A couple of hours on Saturday evening, mostly, you know, single moms with their kids or some older women who didn't have anything else to do and loved coming and talking, and some men would come and help out, lift the heavy pots and things, and get stuff ready. So we used to debone the chicken. It was cheaper, but and also tastier if you use whole chickens. And I had got a house across the street I'd had to downscale, and it was just, it was the best time of my life that in many ways that outside of my children, those years were ultimately my all time best, but but as far as my Catholic years, my my more active, and I would have the pains. He just after the weekend, usually God was kind to me. Some t couple of times I missed missed the weekends, but um, anyway, they've kept it going. They're still delivering. I think they're 200 or 250 quarts on Sundays, and we'd been up to 500 within a year back in 1999. Started in 1998. We had, we had over 400 volunteers within three or four months. It was just, and we had people from the community, from different churches, even a rather anti-Catholic Christian university. Those students came, some staff, not too many staff, a couple, but yeah, we, it was just, God blessed it so much. But going back over it yesterday, oh, and instead of line item, it moved into prose, I, just writing and writing and writing. All the different things I tried, but it did lead me. So my whole premise of my video was to, to, to point out that, because some people had left comments about, oh, you know, we'd like to be like, like I am with, you know, how accepting I am of God doing this and that and the pain and the hardships and, and different things that happened. Uh, I had read these things from the Steroids from St. Saloon, Saloon, um, that 16 years ago, and wrote about it then. And I had practiced some then, you know, tried to take that, darned if I didn't lose it over time. Oh, when I got to the island and faced all those hardships, it was as if I had never read any of this or thought about it. I really was, you know, in a bad way, so upset for all that happened, how I let myself be duped on a tear down and, you know, sold to me as, you know, okay, but needs a little work, needed electrical, but other than that, the roof was fine. No, it wasn't. So, not, rat infested, raccoon infested, and everything and the electrical wasn't done that well ended up having to redo all the electrical anyway except the the box that was the expensive part but everything else all the labor had to be redone rewired things weren't where they needed to be for renovating so just uh but the, my point is is that no i i don't have it together but I have it more now. It's like when we read the scripture and two months later we read it, read the same one, or two years later we're reading the same one, and all of a sudden it dawns on us. 
it comes to mind. The Holy Spirit enlightens us a little more or a whole lot. And all of a sudden we get it. And we're like, wow, you know, why didn't I see that before? But maybe we did see it before, like I have. But it, it and it clicked back then, but just not to this degree. So it it's just bit by bit, God leads us forward and teaches us. And even now, you know, I can think, well, you know, I'm gonna get it this time, I'm gonna stick with this. But something really difficult to face that I haven't really had to face maybe will come along and maybe I'll forget to, to consider that it's all for my good and coming from God for a good purpose. Maybe I will, I don't know until I, he'll test me. That's the one thing. You guys want the same thing I do, which is exciting. I finally found people real, you know, who are really desirous and excited about coming into God is pure love. And you've helped me come to that like last fall and winter, you know, it just sort of evolved. And I see it in some of the things I wrote way back. I, I was reading things about God's pure love but see, it hadn't really gelled. It had clicked, but it hadn't locked in fully because it wasn't ready yet. And even now, maybe not. I'll still have progression. So that's sort of my point is, is that just so you understand, it's not like we get it and we've got it for sure. There's layers of depth to what God gives us. And there's still more, more to come. I, I can't say I'm an enlightened being just, you know, because I understood more two days ago. Or last fall, I thought, wow, this is really stupendous. When I had the, the four words, the first Sunday morning started in like end of September, pray pray for, okay, I'll pray for my children, because I was upset. I, you know, I kept having to face the fact that uh, my children were going their ways, and, and then I even found out more how damaged all my suffering and all that did to them, uh, being with a, a single mother in chronic pain. The, uh, the responsibility, the fears when they were little, all the hardship of that it affected them and as adults it they get reminded just like doing even just my resume of the later years put me in a, a really upset uh going through that um again remembering all that when they just see me and and see how i've progressed in suffering even it, it upsets them it it triggers them it's like ptsd kind of stuff in a way, um, they don't want to be reminded. They want to be in their lives and move forward with their families, their lives, their careers. And so God was trying to help me understand this at a deeper level. So it was to pray, pray for them. Then the next Sunday morning, it was love, love them. Then the next Sunday morning, it was forgive, forgive them understand them to forgive them once we understand it's so easy to forgive and if we don't understand still forgive just trust that there's a reason a good reason people aren't generally unless they're psychopaths they're generally not out to hurt us or sociopaths can be a little that way too they and but they don't even get, understand that they're that way i think my ex-husband he he believed all his lies that he was saying. He was in so deep and for so many years, his life of lies. So then understand that they're not, they're not uh, culpable in a way. I mean, they're sick, they're sick. So uh, it's wrong. At some point in time they chose and they kept going. So yes, it's a sinful kind of illness, but by the time they totally forget, you know, what can you do but forgive and move on, but get away, get away from them. Um, so 
Then the forgiveness, so God gave me two weeks to mull on that one because it's a big one, forgiveness is. We make it a big thing. We make it hard. Once I realize it's just easy, just do it. Just forgive people. Understand them, learn about them, understand them, and have compassion and forgive, then it's easy. Once you understand and have some compassion for people, it's very easy to forgive. I can easily forgive that priest and all that, but it still may, it's painful. It's painful. It was crushing. Well, we want to think the best of everyone. And I tend to have the, be very idealistic about Catholicism and any church and people, very idealistic because I always think, think the best, you know, and then, then I get crushed, then I get hurt, then I get upset. Then you have, then it's hard to trust, but, but we have to keep going. We have to keep trusting to a degree with increased wisdom and knowledge and understanding. God and Holy Spirit gives us these gifts to help us to discern. But anyway, then the next week it was live. And I thought God meant, you know, something to do with my children and living, you know, try to do more things with them or what? No, no. I heard this voice say, no, you live your life now. You live your life now. And I realized I'd been so consumed with not understanding and with the sadness that I had stopped living my life. Because I thought, well, my life isn't that much without even my children wanting to call or to keep me keep in touch. One does off and on, checks up on me every now and then, which is wonderful, and I appreciate it. Oh, she, I think she's concerned. And I look, don't look so well, <laughs> and I'm not so well. So uh, anyway, but that was good. But I thought, wow, I've got it. I understand it. You know, pray, love, forgive, and live my life. But no. I had to learn more this spring even. So uh, just hang in, keep keep trying, keep trying. That's, that's what God wants us to do. Keep going forward, keep going forward. And I'm not going to live, oh, I, I doubt even another four years, but whatever I do live, I'm learning. I think, I'm, I think this made an impact on me the other day when we were talking about the different sufferings and what St. Saluan said and and the little test he said to test, test ourselves. If we're at peace, we're in God's will. If we're not, if we're still upset, if we're not calm, if we're, then we know that, that we're not in his will and we just pray more to ask, you know, what's your will? And we, we, we examine ourselves, are we clinging to something that we're saying or thinking it's God's will, but it's really something we want. That's usually with me what happens, is that it's, it's, it's really me more, um, more my will. And it just doesn't work that way with God, I'm realizing. It's not my way or the highway, it's God's way. It's God's way, it's His will. And the more I learn to be in His will, pray, to be in his will and pay attention, pay attention to the, the things going on around me and the thoughts that come to mind and my prayer life. Um, these are just little tips that God gives us to help us know his will. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that I don't know <laughs> and I'm not there, but I keep getting closer and so do you. And it's not that often that God will have like a mystical infusion in someone. You know, like we read about it, a venerable Lieberman had an incredible conversion. He was a Jewish young man and um, became Catholic. And he also became a priest then. Just real fat, boom, boom, boom. He was, it was an infusion of spiritual life in him where he became, he uh, converted, had a, had an immediate conversion, just like that, just or practically so. 
And there was another one, um, his last name starts with a V. Um, I think it's a V or something. Anyway, and it was in France. And somebody made a, a bet with him that if he would just go in and stay five minutes or something like that before an icon of the Virgin Mary or a painting before the, of the Virgin Mary, um, you know, just did it as a wager. And the man had this massive conversion, a miraculous conversion um, in that church, in that Catholic church in Paris. Maybe it's Notre Dame, even I'm not sure. But so it can happen like St. Paul had. He had an, um, an immediate, massive kind of conversion, but not often. We pretty much as God wills. So with me, it's pretty much bit by bit. He teaches me things and then then to learn it better and better, I get more trial or more difficult trial or whatever he keeps, keeps moving me along. But every now and then it gets very exciting when it really seems to make sense, make sense. And we live a little more life and get tried to see do you really, do you really know it? Do you really, it's like practicing an instrument. You know, every now and then the, the teacher has a recital and you have to, have to do your performance by memory. See if you really know it. <laughs> so just think up little practice lessons for yourselves if, if you like doing these kinds of things. I love practicing the spiritual life. But I wanted to share some advice from St. Francis de Sales on suffering. It's more than what I had mentioned the other day. I think I'd mentioned like three things the other day, but I'm going to share these things. Um, this, this was from back in February of 2008. So coming on nine years, it's eight and a half years. I mean, um, 16 and a half years with this. So um, it was, um, it was back when I was, was you know, realizing about victim souls of the sacred heart of Jesus and how we can offer our sufferings and that God utilizes us. And as we mentioned the other day, St. Saloon did, you know, suffering, suffering is the way that God helps us. He often has to suffer. Um, in God's view, suffering is not the bad, evil thing that we think it is. The, yes, it's painful. It can upend our lives as we knew it, but if that's what God's will is for us, and it was for me, he made it very clear he didn't want me out in the world. And he blessed me by even having someone come and tell me that from the other side, that I would be too easily drawn back out into the world if he healed me. You know, God wanted me to be his more. In a, in a more defined way than out in the active world. So um, this, is, this is what um, St. Francis de Sales said to a woman suffering great physical pain. He told her this, you are being crowned with his crown of thorns. And then he said this also, to love God in sugar little children would do as much but to love him in wormwood that is the test of our amorous fidelity so it's easy to love god when it's simple when it's sweet when it doesn't last long when it's easier but to love him when it gets difficult that's a test of our of our faithful love of just how much we are willing to love him. To say, Viva Jesus on the mountain of Tabor. St. Peter, while still carnal, has courage enough. But to say, Viva Jesus on Mount Calvary. This belongs only to the mother, Mother Mary, Mother of God, and to the beloved disciple who was left to her as her son. So, you know, on, on Mount Tabor, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up, and they were wowed, you know. Oh, you are Christ, you are Jesus, you know, you are, 
Jesus Christ, this Lord and Savior, you, you transfigured all this incredible supernatural experience. But at the crucifixion, it was a different, a different perspective. Things became more serious then in a different way. So, so he says, St. Francis de Sales goes on to say, So then, my daughter, behold, I commend you to God to obtain for you that sacred patience. We need patience when we suffer. We need patience. But you will say you can hardly keep your thoughts on the pains our Lord has suffered for you while your own pangs oppress you. Well, my dearest child, you are not obliged to do so, provided that you quite simply offer up your heart as frequently as you are able to this Savior and make the following acts. So, when the going gets really, really rough and we can't make any heroic statements or we can't think, oh, you know, this suffering is, I'm suffering for God and this is, this is what I want and Thank you, Lord, for helping me to, to endure this suffering or whatever. And we're all up on the mountaintop experience of suffering. No. Um, we, we have to make these certain acts to understand how to suffer when it going gets really rough. First, accept the pain as from his hand. We've heard this one before. Just repeating it. As if you see him himself putting and pressing it on your head. Second, offer yourself to suffer more. That's a repeat one that I said a few days ago. Third, beg our Savior by the merit of his torments to accept these little distresses in union with the pains he suffered on the cross. So that's a little different. To take our sufferings that we're given, that God allows us, it isn't that God is causing the sufferings or, or um, himself harming us. Or, no, it's not that. Suffering comes from sin. But we trace it all back to original sin, and we're part of humanity. We're born into it. We have, we're, we're part of humanity, so we have, we're part of, of original sin. But, um, but suffering isn't necessarily the evil. The sin is. It's not the suffering. Suffering's just the thing. It's a thing. It's a, it's an experience. It's a situation. It's a um, energy. Suffering is energy. Just e even with pain, the blood pressure rises, the temperature rises. There's power. There's energy going on in the body when there's suffering. When there's pain, and emotional suffering. The brain chemistry changes. Things start to happen. You can even have strokes when you have too much pain. That's physical pain, but also with emotional pain. You can go into despairs and your whole body, you know, depression sets in and all of that. So pain is powerful, but he says, um, offer our sufferings to God and then look to his on the cross um, and and ask him to take our sufferings and unite them with his major sufferings that were on the cross. And somebody asked me the other day, you know, didn't I think uh, in a comment, because I think the person thinks, and I, at times I used to sort of think, you know, be a little bit smart aleck or something and or realistic and, and thought well Jesus suffered three hours on the cross and I'm going through these pain sieges for 40 years and constant pain but the really bad sieges when I before I had somehow the, the really bad headache ones um, have stopped the, the ones that would get way way out of control where I would need Demerol and Vistral injections um, and strong ones, big ones, big doses to knock me out. Um, since I've had the pump in, coming on four years in October, somehow that affected the arachnoiditis so that I don't have that or it's getting 
medication to the right place inside the spinal column, spinal cord area, the dural space. But, um, but before I did think, wow, you know, three hours, but I have to just keep going and going and going. Well, God keeps me going and going and going. He sustains me. And it would be when I would come out of those heavy sufferings, I would be rather euphoric. A priest noticed it. He says, you are just like, it's like there is some kind of a aura of peace and calm and even exhilaration about you after the horrible sufferings. Because he came over one time when I was having one to anoint me. And, but um, my mother and her friends, because my mother didn't live in the same town. She lived in Arizona. and But she would uh, call and could tell by my voice immediately. And um, then three days later, a week later, 10 days later, however long it would last, I would be just on top of the world. And, and so her friends suggested to her, <laughs> well, maybe your daughter's bipolar. She sounds manic, you know, so down, down, down and despairing and, and barely able to think about wanting to even take another breath or live another day. Well, I didn't get that bad with the children because I was living for them. But I did have an adjustment after they were grown. You know, I had to <laughs> get with it and say, no, I I'm, I'm have to live for the sake of Christ, you know, and because that's what he wants of me. But, uh, but I told her, I said, no, I said, I'm not bipolar. I said, the suffering is so intense. And when God lifts it off of me, and I come back to just regular suffering. It is just so wonderful and such a relief that I, I'm just euphoric. I'm just so thankful and grateful. And my mom immediately understood, you know, she says, oh, that makes so much sense, you know, but it was a relief, I'm sure. It's amazing, other people can really, can really uh, frighten people with their ideas, but you never know. What if I were? And then her friends would have maybe done a great favor, and my mother would tell me, and oh, well, maybe I am, and get checked. Oh, yes, you're bipolar. Here, take some medicine. You'll feel better. No, it's not that. <laughs> it's it's intense pain sieges, but I'm not as I don't don't have them. Praise God for the pump. Even though I I had I have eating problems now from the pump, but it's worth it to have those the out of control headache things those those were horrible it's, the, it's what we're given is enough for us god knows exactly what he what's okay and what's too much and what's not so um but god allows the suffering because it's powerful for one thing our prayers are extra powerful when we pray when we're suffering when we pray for others when we're suffering. I have noticed over the years that um, those prayers tend to cause movement, positive movement in others and in myself. Um, there's energy in the pain, a supernatural energy also, when we include love, when we love enough, when we suffer to offer our sufferings for others and to offer our prayers for others. So, that's something we just learn to do. It's like practicing the piano or something, or clarinet, I played clarinet. It, you know, if you want to get better and better, you practice these things. Train ourselves, train the will, train the mind to remember. And that's what I have, I'm having my refresher course. And so when, and I'm also learning to remind myself that if I didn't get that much painting done today, it's okay. I got what I did get done and I'm grateful for it. And I'm thankful the HOA people haven't been around for a while, but if they are, I now understand them. I understand them. I understand how uh, confusing someone like me is to them an old lady doing these things because most people want things done fast 
and I've had to learn slowness. That's one of my nine S's that undergirds my hermit rule of life, how I'm supposed to live slowly in part, do things slowly, ponder things slowly, um, not be rash or hasty. And that includes in expectations. I, I had made a little goal for myself today of how much I was going to get done of the painting. Mistake, mistake. Let God decide how much. I'm just to get the brush, pick it up, and start. That's, that's all I'm to do. And then God decides through pain how long I will paint and what doesn't get done. I'm to be grateful and think, oh, wow, look, look, I got those doors painted over there. I'm not sure. I, I guess it was okay. I painted them the same color as the house because I didn't think I wanted them to really stand out that much. But now that I'm looking at them, maybe they... I could have painted them mysterious. That's what I'm going to paint the front door. But I guess just simple is always simple. Simplicity is another one of my INSs. So now I'm going to keep that, that end of the house very simple. Simplicity. So there, that solved that. That solved that little dilemma. So um, anyway, we, we come up with your game plan, your, your map, your map of life. There's an excellent book. It's, in fact, I think the publisher is Sneed, um, and it's called Map of Life. Oh, I'll have to, I'll get that out and show it to you next time. Map of Life, I'll find the author. It's an excellent book, a basic, a classic. And um, so it's good to have a rule of life, but a map of life is, is wonderful. And of course, God is in charge. It's God's will, not ours, our will. So that's a training we need to do. And it's a matter of just repeating these things. It sounds simple, too simplistic maybe, but no, simplicity is a good thing. And stillness is good. And silence and solitude. Take some time to be silent and think through. Think through uh, what is God's will and what's my will in this or that situation. And then pray, ask Holy Spirit, help me to know. Am I, is, am I uncomfortable? Am I not at rest or peaceful because I'm not in God's will? And chances are that's right. Because if, if we're in God's will, we're going to have peace and calm. And that's why today, right now, I do just even talking through and, and simplicity for the paint, the doors over there. I just glanced over and I thought, oh, maybe I should have, you know, getting into confusion. And God is into every detail of our life because we're in God and God is in us. And pure love, learning pure love is to be in every aspect of God's pure love. God loves when we take up a little project, when we try to improve something, when we're making something better for eventually for another person who will like live here, or we mow our yard and do a good job because other people walk by and there's something very peaceful about a freshly mowed yard looks neat and tidy and gorgeous um, or if you have my neighbors put stone in their yard they didn't want to mow much and that looks very neat and tidy too and just it looks interesting it's a nice diversion from everybody else's grass so um, people do things to uplift the environment and for their own lives which is a nice thing to do. If they didn't like to do yard work, then that was a good thing that they did. Um, they love my trees and they're very grateful for them, which I think is beautiful. They like looking over, but they're very busy in an active life, doing other 
charitable works of mercy for other people. So it made sense that they don't spend their time. I need that kind of exercise that gardening does. And it's, 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 um, tends to be, I don't know why, but I suppose because of the solitude and the silence. There's a connection with God when you garden, seems like, or paint, or do any kinds of very methodical uh, hobbies or manual labor or artistic endeavors. And by artistic, that runs the gamut. Um, sports are art artistry. Ain't writings artistry. Um, children playing is artistry and laughing. And, uh, people conversing on the next door on their patio. That's art. There's an artistry to conversation. So um, everything's a very positive. The will of God is very positive. And it's a matter of us getting on that that road of his will that in that map of life follow his directions and i liked i liked what saloon said about about um how we need to really um know that if we're not at peace it's usually because we're not in god's will and to make some corrections it's all it takes all that needs to be done Sometimes it takes a lot to make. So it might be a big correction, but we have to look at everything very simple, simply. That if it's not in God's will, then it's not for us. Then we should not be doing it, at least not in this point in time. God may have that for us later on. And if you're involved in something, a situation with other people, and oh no, please stay, don't, don't stop. And, um, we can say, well, maybe later on I can rejoin or something like that. But for now, this isn't for me. It's not what I'm to be doing. So, um, so we're supposed to accept the little distresses in union with the pains he suffered on the cross. Um, we are to also then next in our sufferings um, tell God that we wish not only to suffer, but to love and to cherish these sufferings, since they are sent from so good and so sweet a hand. It's similar to what St. Salome says. So um, you might want to jot these things down, the ne that, that we are to tell God, tell, tell God or Jesus, Holy Spirit, or all three, or the Trinity, that, um, and even if you don't feel it in your gut yet, just say it. Because we have to get used to understanding these concepts and seeing suffering. And suffering as God views it, not as we view it, not as we've been conditioned to view it by society even, or other people at times. Um, so we, we say uh, we not only wish to suffer, but I want to love and cherish these sufferings since they are sent from you, God, who are so good and so sweet and care so much about me. I'm probably gonna make just little little index cards or little notes that I'm going to put. See, even my, I'm getting such terrible. My injection didn't last long at all. I have to tell you, my bit back is just atrocious. So, but, Jesus, thank you for this mid-back suffering. I wish for even other suffering, more suffering, if it is your will, obviously. And furthermore, what does he say here? I want to love these. I'm going to love this suffering, this back. It's just a back after all. There's nothing that can be done about it physiologically that the neurosurgeon feels is wise to take on at this time. So I love it. I embrace my L1, T11, and 12 crumbled discs. And I am bulging out and all that, or the vertebrae are crumbling and the discs are bulging. <laughs> and 
and I'm grateful because my spine is as my dear loving God who is so good has allowed me for this time in my life. This is what you've allowed for me. And I know that I made it worse probably by lifting some things that maybe were too heavy and I didn't stop to stop myself, probably made my spine worse, but also it when you're all fused up, the neurosurgeon said the next layers start to go in time. You could just when you walk or stand, the pressure it this starts to destroy or break up the the and squish the discs above that fusion. So it's all part of life, Lord, and I thank you. Um, lastly, invoke the martyrs and the many servants of God who enjoy heaven as a result of their having been afflicted in this world. And it's not just that they were afflicted in this world, but it's that they accepted the afflictions with love. love they kept their love of God and it's okay, even if people lash out at God and blame God, as long as we get ourselves around to the point that we say, I'm sorry, Lord, for losing it. I do love you. And I know that you aren't hurting me for any bad reason at all. You know what's best for me. You have allowed me to be in this world and suffering happens in this world. And the suffering that you have allowed in my life was always to guide me doing that resume, that the, especially the Catholic years, oh my. That showed me just how God really was guiding me. Even in my hermit life, he didn't want me involved in parishes. Finally, finally, it took I was actually, it's only been like three years, four years that I realized, deep down realized, I'd thought of it before, but this time it just made such sense. All of the saint hermits, they weren't involved in parishes. The bulk of them weren't. They weren't developing programs or writing grants or, um, now the soup kitchen thing, that was that was in a way a penance. The Virgin Mary had me do that. It, I, I had been in some trouble and that was that was a penance, but it was a beautiful penance. I mean, it was a wonderful thing. And part of the penance part was is that it got taken away from me. God was ready to move me on into hermit vocation. And he allowed me that last hurrah of even miraculous energy on the weekends. Then I would collapse, but my son was happy when, in a way. He says, well, he says, well, I know this is terrible, Mom, but he says, I'm, in a way, I'm sort of glad because he said the phone was ringing and, and you were always on the phone. It was always, and all these people were coming to the house needing this and that. And, and he says, now I feel like I've got you back more. And it was his that his junior year in high school. So my my precursor, my, my hermit vocation began immediately. And then of course, when he came home in the evening, I would be, and he'd do his homework then, but anytime I was always available to him. That, that was a ground rule. I, he would not going to be without me to converse with him or to help him with homework or, um, get him to his guitar lessons or anything he needed um, when I was in my first hermit years. And then, then he went off to college and then I, then I had all the time to focus. But I leached out doing things in the church, trying to help, started a Padre Pio prayer group in one parish and had loads of people come and got the big certificate frame, got it framed and from from San Giovanni Rotondo. This was an official Padre Pio prayer group. You had to be approved for it by the group in San Giovanni Rotondo. And um, I had spent a lot of money buying book, Padre Pio books for everybody. 
and made up notebooks of his prayers and different things of his life. And, and um, then the priest, first meeting, there were like 45 or 50 people there, which is a good turnout. And, um, and he says, no, you, you can't lead it. You're not gonna lead, you're not gonna do the meeting. And it was terrible. And so the, the partner I had though, helping, uh, she, she froze. She says, oh no, I'm not good in front of people. Well, she had volunteered, wanted to be a part of it. That was, see, that was a mistake I made but maybe not because God, and then so I said, I'm sorry, I can't, So, but it only lasted the next meeting. Uh, he didn't want me there at all. In fact, um, it wasn't long after he, he got me out. He says, I couldn't come to mass there anymore. Couldn't be in that parish anymore. Um, the bishop, people had written letters or something. They thought I was the problem. It was the priest had a problem. So, but I got, it's just, I have just the craziest life. Uh, serious problems. And that's why people saw me talking with them a lot. Um, because another priest told me I wasn't to report it. But, and my spiritual da said not to, but that was, he only wanted to protect me. My spiritual da admitted that later, later on, that he didn't always guide me wisely because after a while he hated to see me always getting blamed for things or having awful things happen. He was afraid that I would leave Catholicism even. He says, he says, what you've been through is just so terrible. But um, no, I, I'm, I'm not leaving Catholicism. Um, we're all sinners, I'm a sinner. And if everybody who gets upset that, that the ideal isn't happening. We just have to try harder to get ourselves to be ideal. That's why we need to learn pure love, the love of God, and to forgive and to love and to pray and live our lives in that mode. Um, quitting isn't gonna change things. That's not gonna help the church reach its ideal or people reach their ideal. We have to help one another and get ourselves up to par. Try to, by the grace of God. That's the only way we can do it is by, through God and the Holy Spirit. So we have to hang in and keep going. So let's see. So we say all these things, last, invoke the martyrs, ask them for help. Call upon Padre Pio, call upon even your guardian angel, he's not a martyr, but he will help you. Um, Jesus, of course, on the cross. You know, I, I often cry out, to, when, the, when it gets really bad, I call out to Jesus to help me. Come help me, come hold me. Lift me up to you on the cross. Keep me, keep me with you. Um, I call out to my parents, my grandmother, who I was close with. The other grandmother I, did, I didn't know in earth. She died a year before I was born, but I'll know her soon, pretty soon, <laughs> sooner than a year ago. So let's see. So here it says, call upon those who've been through it. In other words, ask them for help, supernatural help, and they will. I promise you they will some weird little thing will happen and you'll maybe try to start noticing these things. That's one thing. Suffering is, is a pretty solitary kind of ordeal. And um, especially if it's chronic, people scatter. If you have suffering for very long, and you're out of the social realm, you're uh, it's hard for people to handle being around people who suffer all the time. You can't do what they do. So makes a difference. That time, that's a blessing because it gives you the silence and the solitude to start noticing how God is working in your life and how everything, God is involved in everything.
all the good. And he'll allow the devil. He, he allows, I mean, there's another portion I'll do another video on about, um, about handling evil when we're suffering because the devil tries. When we're weakened in any way, there's the devil trying to work on us. So um, that's when people would get upset with something that happened to them in church and, and say, well, I'm done with this one. You know, I'm not gonna be this or I'm leaving. Um, what did the people call it? Um, recovering Catholics, like they were alcoholics and that they finally got rid of their bad habit or something and they left Catholicism. They call themselves recovering Catholics. Um, it's really sort of a, I think sort of a put down for people who genuinely have addictions that they have, have overcome through God's grace um, so, anyway, the, he also says this, Siloan says, or no, this is St. Francis de Sales, sorry. Um, it is not dangerous to desire a cure, and do, indeed you must carefully seek one. For God who has given you the, the evil, oh, oh, no, that's a mistypo. Um, uh, for God, he hasn't, this is not an evil suffering, is it? But he allows evil in the world that causes the suffering. But he is also author, though, of the cure. God is behind the ones who create medications. The Holy Spirit. Uh, any breakthroughs with science. God is the creator of science. God's the creator of the elements that make the medications or the, the abilities that neurosurgeons have when they get some new technique that has been developed by someone. Who's in that person? Who is behind all of the good and all of the creative force in the world? Who is the creator? It's God. So, yes, we're to seek cures carefully, this St. Francis de Sales mentions, prudently, because there's a lot of goofy stuff out there, frankly. You can really get taken. Uh, some people, you know, New Age people, will promise that, the, you know, healings or whatever. Maybe, maybe not. I wouldn't do it. Um, if it's a Christian, then they will do it. They won't charge you if it's a Christian who has the gift of healing. Go to a healing mass. You're not charged. If God heals you, he heals you through the laying on hands of someone. Um, that's how, um, oh, he's my buddy too. Gonna, oh, Fiacre, St. Fiacre had, uh, he could lay hands and heal that way. So, um, so seek it out. There was, uh, oh, it's a few years ago, maybe it's still going on. It was a rage thing. Um, they claimed they could draw out toxins through the bottom of your feet by putting your feet in this little tub with electrode wires in it or something. And then the, the water would turn all these icky colors and they say, oh, these are all the toxins coming out of your body. People with cancer would go and get their hopes up thinking it was getting all the cancer drawn out through the bottom of their feet. In fact, my son was working for Inside Edition at the time and I said, oh, do this story. Because I knew a, a woman, a Catholic woman who believed it. She was spending money having that done to her feet. Every week she would go and spend like, I don't know, 80 bucks. And it was just a farce. The reason the water turned that way was because of of um, the certain kind of wires in the machine that these people would buy at these spas. And it would turn the water, these icky colors, nothing from the feet, it did absolutely nothing. And so my son did do that program on Inside Edition to debunk it. And a person who was actually doing the treatments, she got very upset being exposed, but, but you know, we can't have that kind of fraud going on. 
um, online they even exposed, they put, they put like a carrot in and the water would still turn colors, you know, so. Um, anyway, but seek a cure, a reasonable one. One that is, would be approved of by God, you know, something sensible and re real, not, not a fraud kind of thing or um, n not something that's going, especially if it's for someone else, going to get their hopes up and then it wasn't going to ever happen to begin with. So, those were the step-by-step -step recommendations, and I just made some notes that I find them to be very good, and that I was just going to simply try to do them in, in the order that he gives them. And I did. I did start doing that more. And I do now, but I'm not as methodical about it. I And I think I would do better if I were a little more strict with myself on it, such as to call out to the different martyrs for help. Um, I know there's there's different saints that have had things happen to their backs. Um, oh, one, Alexandrina, Saint Alexandrina, or maybe she's blessed still, but she, she broke her back. She uh, chose to jump out of a window rather than be raped. Who could blame her? and um, broke her back and was paralyzed and uh, suffered terribly. Just because people are paralyzed doesn't mean they don't have pain. And it, it, you just can't move. You're, you're, and you're a uh, prisoner to n not even being able to distract using your body then. And she became very close to God. Um, and thanked God for her suffering. So the saints, the saints do these things and God brings them gifts. He, he blesses them. And then the alternative is, is to complain and get down, despair, be depressed. Um, just think about nothing but trying to find the next thing that might help us. Take more and more medication. That, at least with my pain, that doesn't work. You know, unless I would just get knocked out. You know, get anesthetized, that would work, but then I'm not really living. So, there's a certain amount of pain. I, I have a goodly amount that I just need to live with and when it gets to a certain point I can't then I have medication for what's called breakthrough pain and I take that reasonable route rather than getting fussy or my voice grumpy or um, start to get down and, and negative I can always tell I start getting negative I used to not be able to tell and other people, you know, my kids would say, have you, you know, have you taken your medicine? You know, you're, you're getting off. <laughs> so as they were older, they would even, they could hear in my voice on the phone, you know, or if I was just for a couple of days, even everything was not looking good and, <laughs> and frustrated or whatever, you know, are you on top of your pain? Are you, you know, are you handling that? Are you managing it? And sure enough. So we do what we can do. And these were just little different notes that I was learning about things. Um, it says, I said here, um, it is a benefit to ponder just why God has sent certain suffering, certain ones, just ponder why, why. You'll come with the answers, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Note when he sends them and to even detect a kind of theme of the sufferings. Sometimes there's little themes of lessons, for there always seems to be a theme of lessons. He is teaching us in these sufferings, besides the ongoing theme of love. He wants us to also understand what Jesus went through, what he went through as a person. If you are in love, you want to know and experience everything 
that the, ob the person of your love has lived and done. You're, you're very cued in. When you want union with someone, like Jesus, I want union with God, with Jesus. And therefore, I want, I want to experience, I, this is all part of it, is to be so intimate with God that we even understand, at least understand, the depth of his sufferings. And even now, how frustrated, how frustrated the sufferings ought to be just by how we keep bumbling along us people. And when, when, when kids murder kids in schools, it, it has to hurt Jesus, I would think, I mean, and so we, we offer our sufferings to participate in it with Jesus. We, we unite with him, even now. He's not on the cross on Golgotha right now, but in essence, his sacred heart sorrows. Sorrows for our condition, for our sins. So sometimes Jesus wants us to slow down so we have time to ponder. Sometimes he seems to want us to consider someone we need to forgive or to forgive ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves or to understand a theological and scriptural truth. Sometimes he wants us to simply rest in him. And I often, off and on, I go through a phase of nesting in the sacred heart. I call it that, where we just, I just say, Lord, I'm just, I just want to nest in your sacred heart. Nest in your sacred heart. It's such a comforting concept to nest inside Jesus' sacred heart and explore. What's inside Jesus' sacred heart like? You guys think of ways or things that you think of or experience nesting in his heart. Um, what that's like, what the perspective is, how your life changes when you're nesting in his heart. Um, let me know. I'm curious about your perceptions on a lot of these things. God bless his real presence in us and have a beautiful evening morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And I so appreciate you all very, very much. I love you all. And I'm grateful because this is one thing I did write in an apology for my going on and on in prose on my resume <laughs> of the later years. And triggered back into all that, that I have so benefited from these videos and meeting you all, I am, I feel like I'm being healed by you guys. You beautiful, loving, Christian, many of you Catholic, most of you maybe, whatever. It's, it has really lifted me up and I'm very grateful. I, I'm grateful for the healing from your beautiful souls. Thank you. God bless you all.